I needed a title before I went live. Happy Friday, everyone. Welcome to the live show. Let me bring up Facebook so I can get a sense here, make sure that I'm actually live. It looks like I am. My story says that I am. I am old. I don't know what a story really is, and I don't really care. That is the beauty of being old. You don't have to worry about these things. The marketers that reach out to me tell me, you could you could make billions in 10 minutes if only blah, 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 blah. No, I say, Mr. Marketer, I'm not falling for your trick. I don't want to hustle a bunch just because you're telling me that I have to in order to make money, which isn't true. Okay, how do I... This is interesting. It's not letting me uh, click through to my live where I would see my comments. <laughs> how how unusual. Okay, well, whatever. I guess I have to see the comments here, which means I have to make this bigger, which puts me at a risk of not looking at the camera, which means I don't engage the audience as much as they tell me. They tell me I should. Anyhow, enough of that. I got a bunch of juicy comments here. Let's move the comments box over to my right. <clears throat> Welcome to your pre-Friday beer binge live show. I don't know if you're going to go for a beer binge or not. The weather here, as I look out my window, has turned. We are now Victoria, British Columbia, Canada, is this gorgeous city on an island off the coast of Canada, off the west coast. So we live on an island that's confusingly called Vancouver Island. Everyone knows Vancouver. It's the, one of the two cities in Canada most people know. Maybe Montreal too. Montreal, Toronto, and Vancouver. Victoria is on an island called Vancouver Island off the coast. And Victoria is a magical place. It's gorgeous. L growing up on an island is really cool because everything is less convenient. And that almost predisposes you a little bit to, um, to be willing to disengage with some of our society's obsession with hyper productivity, unhealthy productivity, I would say. And so like, that's a beautiful thing. And this part of Canada, Victoria, is the most temperate part of all of Canada, all of the land. And what that means is our weather is very moderate. So we rarely drop below freezing during the winter. Not by rarely, I mean, you know, we'll have maybe 10 on a, on a cold winter, we'd have like 20 days, but that'd be a lot. Typically like between five and 10 days where it's below freezing rarely have snow, although that's, that's increasing with climate change. Um, but the reason I'm sharing this with you is because there's something that happens here, which is very distinct, at least for me. And what happens is that about eight months of the year are heaven on earth. It's beautiful weather. It's sunny. It's magnificent. We have so many gardens here. Lots of plants grow beautifully, tons of flowers, but come this time of year, we shift into the most depressing time of year ever. And the reason that that's the case is because we just have overcast. We're just overcast for the next four to five months. There's no, there's not a lot of rain. We get rain, but nothing like Vancouver or Seattle. Vancouver in particular, because they got all those mountains. So the clouds come, hit the mountains, and then dump. Victoria, we kind of, the clouds like dump all their rain on Vancouver and then make their way here and are like, yeah, we don't have anything to do. Or they just pass over. So we end up with a lot of overcast and the nature of that is you look out and you just see like this ceiling about five feet above your head for four months. So that's the somewhat depressing part of uh, this time of year. I and mean, that's what we're in. So the weather's turned. It's a good time for a giant beer binge. <laughs> I'm going to size that mug. That being said, if you get a chance to come to Victoria, it's incredible. And I highly recommend it, even and especially if, um, if you're... Uh, like coming in this time of year, because there's lots of beauty available um, at this time of year here in Victoria, lots of cool hiking. Um, as long as you've got the right rain gear for it, it's not offensive at all. You can really kind of enjoy it. And the, the forests are very beautiful to walk through when you've got light rain, excuse me, which we tend to have a lot of. Okay, let's bring my live page up. I'm gonna click through here. Oh, weird. You can't do it anymore. Facebook's taken away the ability to click directly into a live. That is fascinating. So how do I... Oh, I do it that way. I, I see. I click directly on the video. Hey, Jess White. Now I can see your comments, of which there are zero. Okay. Well, look at all these juicy topics. Let's start, as I always do, by just checking in 
uh, to see about the week. How has the week been? The week has been one of those weeks that for me has felt, um, it's felt very full, not necessarily busy, but definitely like the energy of the week has felt very full. My calendar doesn't look any more full than any other week. It, it is full. Um, full for me is four calls on any given day. And pretty much every day this week has had four calls. And the week, good morning, Jess. The week prior to that, I was in uh, Philadelphia working, doing an on-site visit with a client of mine and about uh, seven members of his team. So if you saw the live I did in the evening there when I was wearing a tie, I was at the tail end of that. So there's been kind of that, that week was pretty packed in, travel, came back, had a weekend, and then bam, into this week. And I noticed that's left me feeling mm, like mildly anxious and at times disempowered about the work that, that I quote unquote had to do. Like I would get up and be like, oh, I got to talk to four people, four clients that have committed to working with me. Ugh. And like, I'm being a little silly in, you know, making fun of myself for not wanting to like talk to the people that have committed to working with me. But there's like a very real part of how that occurred to me, which was, ugh, I don't want to do this. And um, the, the, so that's like the back side of that was like the travel with the client. The front side of that is I've got, um, I take December and June off every year. So December's blocked and November is already mostly fully booked up. And then I've got people wanting, you know, to book time with me or to, to schedule something. So I'm booking out into January in order to honor um, the preciousness with which I hold my time. It doesn't mean I don't find time for things, but it means that like when I look at my calendar and I'm like, boy, I could really fit them in here. I could just book a fifth call and I could. Um, I recognize I know how it is when I do that. And the way it is when I do that is I don't have time to answer any emails. I don't have time for any of the other surrounding stuff in my life. And it starts to, I feel resentful when I do that. I resent myself. Why did you book this, Adam? Stupid. And I resent um, the person that I booked that time with. It's not their fault. They just said, when are you free? And I told them and I booked them. So as a result, I'm booking out into January. And that lends itself, I noticed, to a bit of feeling like, oh my God, there's like no time at all. There's no spare time. I'm booking into January. Holy mackerel. So I've been doing work as that's been in the forefront for me, that that ontological experience, that energetic feeling. In the background, what I've been doing is working with that, sitting down and and like taking on exercises or practices or working with my coach or doing whatever I have to to like, hey, what's the what are the facts of my life? And then what's the story I'm creating about those facts? The facts of my life are I traveled last week. The facts of my life, I have four phone calls this week or today or whatever. The facts of my life are that I don't want to book more than that, you know. And then there's all the story I create. Oh, I, there's never any spare time. Never any spare time. People don't respect my spare time. I don't even know what that really means, but that's the story that gets created. It doesn't really matter what it means. It's just a story that's created along with a frustrated feeling. Ah, stupid idiot people asking me for my time, which I'm desperate for people to do if I if I find myself in a, in a lull. Um, I can't get things done. There's never enough time. Oh my God, you know, so on and so forth. So this is like what it is to be human, is to have a life happening, to be creating whatever we're committed to creating, and then to notice all of the stories that are there. And the practice of leadership is to recognize those stories as stories, as opposed to recognizing them as reality. And that is more than an intellectual exercise. That is like a, a real practice that requires work. The intellectual exercise is just to go like, oh, I feel like I've got a story that I'm super busy today and there's never enough time. And then to go on with the rest of your day being like, oh, I know it's just my story, but, and then to complain about it and to wallow in it. The actual practice of choosing a different story for what's happening is like, oh, here are the facts. I can see that this is a created story and I can see that that created story has sway. Like it's sticky, it's pulling me towards it. And if I wanna have a different experience of today, it's gonna to require some work, some ongoing stepping up out of the mud into a different story. 
And so very deliberately and intentionally each morning, we're creating a new story. What is the story I want to create for today? What is the experience I want to have? Who am I committed to being regardless of the story I have that's going on in the background? And then ongoingly stepping into that, noticing, oh, I'm back in that story. I'm back telling myself a story, a complaint about how there's never enough time, blah, blah, blah. This isn't where I want to be. Okay, I got to distinguish that again. There's my story hooking me and then choose back in. That requires a lot of practice. Sort of like to build your bicep requires a lot of practice at the gym. It's an ongoing thing. It's not like you lifted your bicep, your your weight once with an arm curl, and now your bicep always and forever is, is muscular. It's not how it works. It's an ongoing thing. So I'll talk more about this notion of practicing something versus finishing it. But it's been very live for me this week. It's been up. <clears throat> and I'm a human. You know, when that stuff's up, it's not like my favorite. I get frustrated and annoyed and cranky. And one of the things that's kind of cool is in this line of work, sometimes you get on the phone with a client and they're really stuck in their stuckness, sort of like I'm describing I have been this week. You know, I got to keep choosing out of it. Sometimes I'll get into a conversation with someone and they're just unable to see any anything other than the story that they're stuck in and they're really in it and they're really loathing themselves inside that story. And that is um, that that can be very challenging in this line of work because when someone is in their story, they are working unconsciously, they're working to pull you into the story with them and the rest of the world. You've probably noticed this, like if you have friends that complain that they can never find good women to date or good men to date or good goats to partner with or whatever it is, you can sort of be like, well, there's blah, blah, blah. And they're like, no, even then, blah, blah, blah. And they're like, their story pulls you. It's like got a sucking sensation. You're like, oh, I'm being pulled into the black hole of this person's story. So that's the nature of our thinking, our beliefs, our stories seek collusion. They seek to pull people into it with us because then we're justified. There's no dissonance, et cetera, et cetera. So my job when I'm supporting people and they're deep in their story is to stay outside of it and to feel the pull of whatever is going on for them, that the attempt to pull me into it. And for me to kind of plant a spear in the ground to really stand in, but actually no, like I, I can love you and I really understand that's how it occurs. And that makes total sense. And, and there's nothing wrong with where you're at. And there's another possibility available here. So those calls can be very, you know, when, when, I'm try, when I'm in the practice of working through this stuff myself, they can be very draining. And then on the other side, sometimes I'll be there and then I'll sit with someone and they're like lit up with the possibility of their own leadership, excited about what's next. And those calls can be very uplifting. And the nature of transformational coaching is you never know what's going to show up. And you are willingly opening yourself up to all of it. And to like the weeks when you have just client after client who are like, this is amazing. And they're really like creating insight and maybe even breakthroughs to themselves. And like, oh my God, this is so great. Those weeks are awesome. And the weeks when every single one of your client is stuck is really challenging. Um, so been kind of one of those weeks, less so about my clients, but more just my stuff's been a bit sticky this week. Yeah, but says Bob. Yeah, but that's the sound, right? Of like pulling someone down into our reality. Yeah, I know that there's like, sure, there's nice guys out there, but, and then reassertion of the story. Here's why. Hello, Carol. Nice to see you. It's been a while, I think. So we got a bunch of cool topics. We're going to start with free will, living in a simulation, other philosophical diddling. If you haven't been diddled in a while, philosophically, now's your chance. Get ready for the diddling. Let's do a live pouring of tea first. Here's the mug. It's Chip and Dale. I think Chip is the more smoother one, and Dale has a little bit wilder hair. I believe that's correct. I think that's Dale on the holding all the nuts. And then Chip's like, yo, give me some of them nuts. Or maybe he's just like playing backup. Yeah, see this tea, live tea pour. Ooh, it's coming. I, I was impatient this morning. My teapot tells me what temperature the water's at. And it got to 75 degrees. I was like, fuck it, 75 Celsius. Fuck it. I'm putting it in there. Let's see how it turned out. Hmm. Tastes a bit mild. But 
How can that be? Really? 25 degrees of temperature makes a difference in terms of how well the tea steeps? I guess what they say is true. It's not as early gray as it often is. So I've learned something today, and I hope you have too. Let's get to the philosophical diddling. Prepare. So uh, Corey, a member of the Forge, a member of our leadership team, in fact, writes, and he says, what are your thoughts on free will? You may be familiar with Sam Harris's work, but if not, he is known for being a strong stand that willpower does not exist. Willpower, free will, is what Corey meant, he, he wrote after the fact. So being a strong stand that free will doesn't exist. I actually found his explanation around this quite freeing in saying that the way we chose to show up in the moment is the only way we could have chosen. Excuse me. To be clear, I don't really care about the debate of this topic, but I'm curious how this fits into the way you think about transformation. Let me know if in the future you prefer to post these somewhere else. So let's talk about Sam Harris and other deterministic um, uh, physicists, we'll say. And we'll talk about like how they construct this notion of free will, and then we can talk about what I think about that, just so that it's clear we're on the same page. So determinism is the belief that you could with enough, like with a, a grand unified theory, meaning a theory that sort of accounted for everything. It, it allowed the force of gravity. It helped us understand how that force interacts with the electromagnetic force, interacts with the strong and the weak nuclear forces. There's four main physical forces that we're aware of in the universe. And we have sort of different laws for each of them. Like we understand gravity works a certain way we understand electromagnetic electromagneticity i guess works a certain way and we have sort of laws that kind of help us understand how those two things come together but we don't have what what scientists call a grand unified theory of everything which is to say one kind of theory that helps us understand how it all works now determinism is the belief that if in theory, if we could create a theory that helped us, like, given this state of the universe, the next state would be this state. That's that's the idea of determinism, is if I could map out every particle, its velocity, what was happening, then I would be able to deter determine, without any possibility of failure, what the next state of the universe would be. So that that's the rough idea, right? And it's kind of like... If I have a panel, you know, like a comic, like a panel that says one plus one equals, then the next panel I know it's going to be two. I'm, I'm trying to make this really simple. So it's like there's that's determined. We don't have to worry. We don't have to wonder like, but what if? No, no, no. We've already made an agreement. We already understand that's the way math works. And so the grand unified theory of the universe would be here is the theory. Here's the hypothesis that has been tested and proven true about how the universe works. Given that, now if we can figure out all the variables, then we have an answer for what will come next. And once we know what comes next, we can have an answer for what comes next after that. And given a strong enough computer, an incredibly powerful computer that could calculate all that, put it into the equation, that computer could also tell us predictively, even though here's where we are now, here's where we'll be in 10 minutes. And then it could just, in theory, run that forward infinitely. With a strong enough computer, you could determine not just where we'll be in 10 minutes, but like, what will things look like in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years? So this is, this is determinism. This is a philosophical belief, ultimately. It's philosophical because we cannot truly test it. Because to have a computer that would be powerful enough to test that theory, it would, it would need to be like bigger than the universe itself. Because you're trying to model, you're trying to capture all of the data of the entire universe, right? So you need a computer that's actually bigger than that. It won't work. But that's the theory. That's the philosophical theory of determinism. And so Sam Harris and other determinists are saying that like, they're now taking that theory and applying it to a human being. They're saying if we isolate a human being and we look at their chemical composition and their, their like emotional state, which is ultimately a, a, a set of chemical states. And if we were able to look at that with enough precision and with a big enough computer, we could be like, okay, this is where they're currently at. 
you know, this neuron's firing and that hormone is in the system and it has a half-life of this long and that blah, 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 blah. Then we could predict the next state and the next state and the next state. And therefore, we kind of know what they're going to do. And so this comes into conflict with free will because they, the, the way it goes is this idea like, let's say that 10 years ago when you were 18, you were in a conversation with someone and they said, hey, I really don't think you should go to university. I don't think it's worthwhile. And you listened to them and you said, okay, but I'm still going to go to university. And then you go to university and now 10 years later, you're a little bit like, I really regret and wish that I hadn't done that. I wish that I'd made a different decision. Sam Harris and other deterministic determinists, determinists hold the belief that we have this belief that we could somehow have chosen differently back then, given the exact same stimulus, right? Same uncle came to us and said, I don't think you should, same stuff. We were in the same place in our life. And we kind of hold this idea in our mind, like, oh, I could, I could have made a different decision back then. And I wish I had, but their argument is, if you were to take yourself and put yourself back in that same moment in time with the exact same stimuli, the exact same stuff happening, the exact same stuff having happened the week before, you would make the exact same decision. You actually didn't have a choice. That decision was almost predetermined for you, deterministic. And so that's the notion where free will kind of comes like, well, then do humans have free will? Can we actually make a choice? Corey is saying this is kind of freeing. It lets us off the hook a little bit, right? Like, oh, I don't have to have regret about that decision. I couldn't have made any other choice. Like, in order for me to get to this point in my life where I'm now regretting that decision, I, I had to make that decision. There's no way I could have ended up any other way than here right now. Therefore, I can let go of regret. So that's the argument from determinism for humans don't have free will. So now we'll unpack that ontologically. We'll look at that from a leadership perspective, all of that. But that's the, the foundation we have to set up. Y'all still following? Is it making sense? I love this stuff, but I'm a nerd and read about this sort of stuff. So let me know if this is making sense or if, if you're not following, because I don't, I can't understand it outside of my own brain. In my brain, I'm like, oh, it makes total sense. Probably spent too long explaining this. Andrew's saying, by the way, he, hey, Andrew, he probably won't go for a beer binge, but it's time to get out the sled and go for a wine one, a wine run up here in Kelowna. Yeah, Kelowna's got good wines and the snowfall is happening right now. Oh, that's awesome. I'm envious of you, Andrew. I love a nice snowfall. Okay, so we've got this situation, which is sort of like given that in the moment, the exact same stimuli, there's no way I could have actually chosen any differently. And given then that that also applies to everyone around me, like they couldn't have shown up any differently. Do human beings have any free will at all? And if not, what's the point in me worrying about the decisions I make? I'm going to make them anyhow. So the, the really simple answer to Corey's question is, I don't know. I don't know if we have free will. I know that I have, if nothing else, the illusion of free will. I know that I believe I have the ability to make a choice. I can be like, am I going to drink a beer now at 10.05 or am I not? And I know that I believe I'm making a choice to do so one way or the other, but doesn't doesn't really, um, it doesn't matter to me. I have that illusion. Who knows if it's actually true? The trouble I find with these philosophical arguments is that people get to the point where they kind of, um, they become resigned. They stop trying to create something different. And you see this a lot with the belief of nihilism. So the belief of nihilism from, I believe, uh, someone, Jens Niles, I can't remember. It was some German philosopher. But nihilism is ultimately this idea like, there is no point to any of this. There's no grand design. There's no grand scheme. It doesn't really in the long run matter what you as a human do while you're here on this planet. There's nothing. And what people do is they take this, this belief, this, this sort of philosophical attitude that life is empty and meaningless. And then the funny thing they do with it is they make that meaningful. They make it meaningful that life is empty and meaningless. So here's how you do that. 
life is empty and meaningless. Therefore, there's no point in me worrying about what I do. That's you creating meaning, right? Given life is empty and meaningless, therefore. Anything that follows therefore is you creating meaning. So in the Werner Erhardt tradition, the landmark tradition, the way they hold this is life is empty and meaningless. And this fact itself is empty and meaningless. So there is no point and that doesn't matter. And what that does is it puts us back in the driving seat. Yeah, there's not, there's not a, a grand arbiter sitting on a throne who's going to judge you for what you did or didn't do. You're welcome to have a different belief. But that's sort of like there's no one at the end of the day that's coming to tell you you did good, you did bad, you're going to get hit on the head, you're not going to get hit on the head. None of that. It's empty and meaningless. The opportunity that presents you now is, therefore, you get to create whatever meaning you want out of life. The meaning you choose is the meaning that you choose. You can choose, mm, I don't think that there's free will, therefore I'm going to give up trying to make any kind of decisions and I'll just do what's easiest. And your life will probably end up being more of what you will predictably create in your life, more of what you're already reliable to do. Or we can sort of like, life's empty and meaningless. I'm going to leave this planet and I'm going to have left whatever energetic imprint I leave on this planet and that's all there is to it. Now, given that fact, what do I choose to make that imprint look like? What do I want to do about that? How do I want that to go? What do I want to make that look like? For me, that's a much more interesting place to come from. And I choose to come from that place, not because it's right or because I've suddenly found a way around the empty and me emptiness and meaninglessness of life, not because that proves that there is free will or anything like that, but just because that's a more empowering place for me to approach the world. And when I enter the world as that, when I come into the world from that place, I find that my life does have meaning. It has the meaning I create for my life. I don't really worry whether or not I'm doing this because I have to and it's all preordained. I don't really worry whether or not it's a function of my free will or a lack of my free will. I just do it because that's what I'm choosing in the moment. And I hold that humans do have the capacity to choose and then to act from their choice. We might need support. But I do believe that what, what transformation, transformational coaches and leaders, what that work allows for is for us to take action, to create lives, to make results happen that are outside of what is predictable for us. So that's in conflict with, with straight up determinism, right? And I don't really care. Determinism becomes ultimately kind of a sneaky trick for people to justify what they're already doing sometimes. If it allows you to forgive yourself more, awesome. That's a great thing. But if it starts to become a reason to stop caring, to resign yourself, to not really subscribe to like making other people's lives better and making your own life better, you know, if it if it if this sort of idea of no free will serves as an opportunity to just check out from engaging fully with your life, then I say that's probably not the most powerful place to come to your life. And, and that's okay, but is that really what you're here for? Is that what you want to do? People often struggle with this when raised with high, um, uh, we would call it like authoritarian religious beliefs. So like a lot of Christianity has a high level of authority in its religious structure, right? God watches you sent his son to die for your sins, at least in some denominations, but then is watching you and judging you at the end. That's a lot of authority, right? Your free will or your choices are a function of what that, that entity says is acceptable and unacceptable. Whereas when people come, so when people come from that kind of belief, they really struggle with these conversations about free will or nihilism because it's like, well, if, if I'm not forced, if I'm not made to do something from, from God, and if there's no point to all of this, well, what do I do? You choose. You choose is what you do. But they struggle with that because they've been raised in such a way that their choice is very largely directed. So the irony of all of this is it's an invitation into your free will, to whatever extent you want to believe it's there. And it doing so, choosing into that, requires the courage of choosing outside of the comfort of you not having a choice. It's very comfortable to not have a choice. It's very comfortable to, to lay back and be like, I don't have free will, so I don't have to choose. Because if you don't have to choose, if you don't have free will, you can't fully be on the hook for your decisions. And that lets you off the hook and just be like, not my fault. Molecules, 
<laughs> I, why did you hit me in the head? Molecules. I'm sorry. So if you want, try that out. See how that goes. I find it a fairly unsatisfying way to go through life. And so I choose the way that's satisfying for me, that lights me up. And I invite you to do the same. Not because I said so, but because your experience is that it's fun to be lit up. The, the last part I'll say on this philosophical diddling is the notion of living in a simulation. So the, this idea uh, is kind of, it starts as a thought experiment and it ends with a, a, a kind of premise. So the thought experiment is this. The universe is vast and infinite in its scope. We're still learning about the universe, but like one of that's one of the arguments. It's infinite in its scope. Given that it's infinite, like infinite means that inf infinite, we can't even really conceive of how big that is. But in the scope of infinite, every possibility that we can imagine has already come to be. And so from there, the next question is, well, in an infinite universe, it's only a matter of time before an infinitely like fine-tuned simulation is created. It's going to happen. And not only is it going to happen once, it's going to happen multiple times. Th that sort of thing is already kind of starting at very, very rudimentary levels. But like we're slowly building AI. We're slowly coming up with, with um, machines that, that through machine learning start to talk to each other using their own specific language that allows them to do that stuff and so on and so forth. So the scope of the infinite means that a simulation will get created not once, not twice, but like multiple times, many, 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 many times. It's just inevitable. So given that simulations are going to get created, given that they will inevitably get created over time with enough time and enough scope and enough infinite space within which all things can happen, those simulations will become arbitrarily um, uh, fine-tuned. Like, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, the resolution will be so good, we couldn't tell the difference between being in the simulation and being in reality, right? They'll be that crystal clear. You know, it's sort of like if you get a TV good enough, it becomes, you know, with 3D and everything, it becomes very hard to discern it from reality. So with enough infinite scope, those simulations that will get created will become, it, you'll be unable to determine them from reality, to discern the two. Therefore, so given all of what I've laid out, the argument goes, Therefore, which is it more likely? Is it more likely that we're the one version of reality that isn't a simulation or that we're one of the many simulations, the infinite scope of simulations that will have been created and that we are in fact, therefore living in a simulation? So people take this, you guys following? Does this make sense? It makes sense to me. People take this idea and again, they create it as meaningful. Or like clever, right? Like they hold out like, well, I believe we're living in a simulation. Cool. Here's the question. So what? Life is empty and meaningless. So what? Does it change what you're going to do on a daily basis? If you are fundamentally unable to discern between whether this is a simulation with all of the ways that we learn to live and all of the physical laws of our universe implanted, set at some point, or this is a physical universe that came into being accidentally, does it make any difference whatsoever to your day-to-day? -day? Are you gonna behave any differently? We're probably not. Because even if those, those, even if the beliefs I have, even if the physical laws that govern how I show up are all created and part of this fabricated simulation, I'm still beheld to them, I'm beholden to them. They still guide my actions. I still do stuff because it fills my heart with love. Whether or not that love is something crafted in a simulation or something that evolved out of reality is kind of irrelevant. And so this is why it's philosophical diddling. It's cool. It's really neat, I think, at least, to like explore these um, constructs, to play with these thought experiments. But at the end of the day, I find I get back to the place like, so what? It doesn't really change that much. And therefore, I come back to what do I want to create in my life from here? What am I going to make my life about from here? And I would argue that very few, if any, people genuinely would do things any differently knowing it's a simulation. I mean, you could say, well, I know it's a simulation, so I'm going to take a gun and just shoot my head because it's a simulation. I'll wake up from it. Okay, go ahead. Give that a go. 
it'd be tragic because those of us that are still in the simulation will miss you and we will feel genuine grief for your departure and we will feel like it's a waste because whatever. And maybe you'll wake up, but maybe you won't. And either way, taking that gun and put it into your head is going to drive up all of the same fears that exist, even if it wasn't a simulation. So again, it doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. So neat conversation, really like fun to engage with from like a sort of, but what if kind of place. But at the end of the day, leadership doesn't happen in that realm. Leadership happens in like, here's where I am and what is it I want to create from here? And what do I need to, what do I need to do or be to create that from here? Um, Andrew sharing, it's super interesting. It almost leaves me with a feeling of, so what? He said this about 10 minutes ago. So exactly, Andrew. So what? You can't go back and change those past decisions you've made. Excuse me. Um, and Andrew says that, you know, um, we get a blank canvas on which we can create, right? That's the fundamental aspect of nihilism. They're, it's empty and meaningless. Make whatever meaning you want to create, right? We get to be artists of our own destiny. And lastly, Andrew says, it's fascinating stuff, but it's really hard to make the connection to my own life on the determinism aspect or even the simulation. I was intrigued by some of the work that Ray Kurzweil, Kurzweil, I always get his name wrong, was doing around AI and extension of life. Ray Kurzweil, uh, I think he founded, um, he might have founded Singularity University. Um, for those of you who have not followed his work, he, he is really big on, um, and I think Deepak Chopra and maybe some other people, really big on life extension and like, um, you know, brain uploading and all of that sort of stuff. There's a lot of people in coaching realm that kind of get drawn into there because in coaching, we're very keen on consciousness and like kind of stepping out of the mainstream a little bit, right? There's like the current and then there's like, Coaching is often going against the current, going against the obvious thing to do in the moment to create something different. What I notice is that that also opens the door to a lot of like um, openness, but without any critical thinking at all. As they say in some communities, like your brain, your your head is so open that your brain falls out. And Ray Kurzweil. Um, it's totally worth checking out his stuff. It's really fascinating. There's a lot of stuff on like life extension and things like that. The funny thing is if you look at photos of him like 10 years ago and then photos of him now, he looks like someone that's aged 10 years in spite of all of the, all of the pills and multivitamins and stuff that he takes, you know, he's, he still seems to be held to the fundamental tenet of entropy. As time goes on, the world becomes more entropic, more chaotic order diminishes. Cancer, stuff like that is entropy. It's the order in our body starts to break down. Hey, Jess, nice to see you. Your, val uh, your Valentine's Day, your Halloween costume looked cool. Okay, well, we've talked at length about the philosophical diddling. It's time to move on to some, uh, some, some proper stuff. Well, it's, not, it's all proper, but... So, um, Monica Vegalam, Vegalam, I'm not sure how you say this name in Indian. She's Hindi, I believe. I'll say Vegalam. That's how I'm going to say it. Vigalam. Monica Vegalam. I bet that's how you say it because I think V's are W's. She asks, what are the structures, Adam, that you create for yourself to stay committed to what you stand for, such as connection with clients, potential clients, writing, speaking? Is it a matter of high productivity, committing to do a task when you say you do it and deep focus, or is it something else? You seem to be doing a lot and still stay in connection conversations with people. Is it just a high level of discipline and output? Good question. There's kind of all of those and none of those. The, the default place I learned, to like the way I learned to show up in my life from a very young age was, was a reaction to a fear that I wasn't enough and I wasn't enough very quickly gets proxied by I'm not doing enough. What I mean by that is if you have an internal fear that you're not enough, then you're kind of like the thing, in, the circumstances of your life that determine whether or not that fear is true is did I do enough? If I did enough, then I am enough. If I didn't get everything done, then I'm not enough, right? So it's a proxy for that underlying internal feeling. Sort of like how, mm, this is a cool distinction that's just coming forward for me, but like for brilliance, the underlying fear is I'm stupid. The proxy for am I stupid becomes am I right, 
right? So that internal fear gets put into the real world as like these proxies. As long as this situation is not showing up, then I'm right. And if I'm right, then I'm not stupid. And if I'm not stupid, then I'm hopefully brilliant. So like the proxy would be winning an argument, making sure that I'm never misunderstood, that kind of stuff. <clears throat> so for me, part of it is like, I'm not enough, I'm irrelevant. And then did I do enough? Did I get enough done? So I learned really early on to be like very fastidious. Inbox zero was something I was very committed to right out of the gate. And all of that stuff made me quite a good project manager. I was really reliable to make sure I had ev my hands on everything and to control everything. Everything was controlled. So I'm, I developed a bunch of strategies in order to avoid being what I was afraid of, in order to manage my fear that still serve me to this day. But I'm also really committed to not living just as those strategies. And so the truth is, excuse me, I'm human like the rest of us. And while I have like a natural, you could, my friend Michelle calls it executive function. You know, I'm pretty reliable to like manage meetings. I, I tend to know what's on my schedule. I'm pretty good at like, okay, I got to have a to-do list. I'm reliable for that stuff until I'm not. And that's kind of the funny way this stuff all works because I don't really like tracking everything down to the T. When I became a lawyer, <clears throat> a lot of that work as a lawyer is being very, very meticulous about the work you prepare. A single missing comma can completely change the nature of the legislation you're drafting. And if you don't believe me, I gotta tell you, you sit in classes in law school about how do you interpret legislation and you learn the difference if someone writes their T-H-E-R-E -E versus T-H-E-I-R, an entire piece of legislation can change. And there are court cases where our lawyers are arguing back and forward for this interpretation versus that interpretation. That is foundational to our legal system. And that's not being silly. That's not silliness. That's, that's a legitimate thing that has to happen because the legislature writes the statute. They write the law. But, but there's many ways we can interpret a law. And so what has to happen is the law gets written, it gets passed into whatever, the, I can't remember the process, you know, the Senate or whatever we do in Canada, it gets voted in, it gets made into a law, boom, it's now a law. And then what happens is the courts have to actually interpret it. <clears throat> really well-written legislation is easy to interpret, but it's all open to interpretation. So, you get very, very, very meticulous about scanning and making sure, did I, is there any T I didn't cross? Is there any apostrophe I missed? I was very good at doing that because of the strategy I'd created to make sure I wasn't not enough, but I hated it. It wasn't the expression of my heart. The expression of my heart was, I am enough, and it's okay if I make mistakes. I can clean up my mistakes. I wasn't aware of this. I was just in the throes of my fear. So when I get afraid, I get super fucking significant about my calendar and my to-do lists. And like, if I'm not conscious, I just get enmeshed in them. My life stops being about anything enjoyable. It stops being about the reason I'm doing stuff like booking time and calendar. And it just starts to become about getting it done and clearing as much off my plate as possible so that I am more than, so that I'm not, not enough. That's what my life becomes about. And I get stuff done, but that's all I do. My experience of myself in my life is I'm getting stuff done. At least I'm not a piece of crap. Unconscious, right? It's below the level of my consciousness. In my consciousness, I'd be like, I'm getting stuff done. I feel good. Thank goodness I'm not a piece of crap. <clears throat> so like that's available to me, but I have to be very conscious with how I use that stuff such that I'm really clear on my commitment. And that's really the structure that probably supports me more than anything is what am I actually committed to? Well, I'm committed to connecting with human beings. When I get into connection with people, life is way richer for me. When I go out and have fun, when I go and play pickleball and meet new people, when I go to an event and like hang out and drink a beer and chat with people, my life is richer. I have fear in the way of all of that. I have lots of fear. For me, there's a lot of fear around connecting with people. I'm awkward, hard to be with. People don't think that I'm that interesting. You know, all of that stuff. I'm very clear that that's just fear. I don't have to, like, I, I, I don't buy into it, but it's still scary. I don't argue with it because that gives the fear power, but I recognize it's there. And it doesn't go away. 
Your fear never does. It just sits there and it's like, hey, by the way, that guy looked at you funny. And that person's looking at their watch as you're talking to them. These people don't think you're that interesting. Maybe you should tell a joke. You should probably tell a cool story about yourself. You should, it's just yammering away. So I'm committed to connection. I'm committed to um, transformation. I'm committed to putting more of a transformational and ontological leadership conversation into the world. And I'm committed that people are inspired and lit up by themselves, by their possibility. So from those places, that gives me a different place from which to engage with those strategies that I became really good at using, right? I can, I can manage my calendar very fastidiously so that I'm not worthless. And what that gives me is a life where I'm continually running away. I'm running out in front of a fear that I'm worthless. <clears throat> it never touches me, but it's always there. Excuse me, I got a cough. So this is like the legend of the sword of Damocles, you know, a, a king and a pauper switch places and the pauper is sitting there like, oh man, I'm eating this delicious leg of mutton and these sexy women are, I don't know, whatever happens to the story, right? I'm trying not to make this misogynistic, but like these sexy men and women are, are coming in my court and talking to me and someone's massaging my feet, but he looks up and there's a sword hanging right above his head by a thin horse hair. And afterwards, he goes to the, the, back to the, the king, who's now acting the life of a pauper. And he's like, how do you manage this terrifying? And the, and the king says, I know, right? And the lesson there is like, that is what it was to be a king back then. It's like, yeah, you had all of this luxury, but also moment at any moment, you would be killed. Literally true, right? There's a lot of assassinations. So that's what that life is like. I'm constantly out in front of not being worthless, but it's always right there, like the sort of Damocles. And that's not a very fun life. Yeah, I get foot massages. Yeah, I get to have grapes fed to me. Yeah, sexy men and women come to me and talk to me as I eat a leg of mutton, but it's moments away. I'm constantly terrified of that sword, that worthlessness hammering me. So if that's how I engage with the fastidiousness, that, that tendency I created, those structures, it doesn't lead to a very rich life. It leads to a life where I'm kind of frantic and frenzied and constantly running. There's no time to slow down because if I slow down, that fear catches up and then I'm in it. If I engage with those tools that I created from a place of like what I'm committed to, then it becomes a much richer life. Again, my fear doesn't go away, but I also don't have to manage it. I just recognize it's there as fear. And so my structures are kind of like getting really clear on what am I committed to today? Second structure is like having that in front of me somewhere. So like I often have, I use a program called Rome Research to, to manage my day. Basically, here's what I need to do today. Here's the to do for today. Here's any notes I create on the fly today. And in that, I have like, this is what I'm committed to right now. These are the projects I'm working on. This is my stand for the day. How am I committed to showing up for today? Breath. Okay, great. I'll take a breath today. Ah, I felt good. Take a breath in the moment. And then the rest of it is about noticing when I am doing something other than that which I'm committed to and choosing back into the commitment. And there's days when that's really easy and there's days when that's really hard. And then there's days when I'm just unwilling to do that. There's days where I am like, okay, I'm committed to like reaching out to, I don't know, 10 people in service of like inviting them to this thing that I'm creating that I believe will really serve leadership and transformation. And I'll have days where I'm like, I'm not going to do that. I'm not willing to engage with my commitment there. And I'll go and play video games. And on those days, my work is to forgive myself, to love myself, to give myself permission to be a human who sometimes does stuff and sometimes doesn't. It's always a practice. So I'm always practicing, engaging with my commitment, choosing my commitment in in the face of the much easier choice to just play video games or to just masturbate or to just eat candy or to just any anything, right? That's always an option. And it's always easier to go that path. So for me, it's like going to the gym. I go to the gym and I do my best to lift the weight that day. And if I don't, I do my best to have a lot of forgiveness for myself for not lifting the weight that, that way that day. And as you practice with this, you get better at making that choice. But it never becomes free, easy, simple, and, and like without, 
There's never a moment where it stops being something you have to choose, in my experience. I continually have to choose into that. I have to make that choice over and over and over again. So that's that's how it is for me, Monica. I don't know if that's how it'll be for you. I notice for a lot of my clients right now, what's up for them is empowering structure. So what that means, the funny thing in this line of work is like a bunch of clients will suddenly like all be up for a particular kind of breakthrough. So right now, a lot of them are at this place where they're like, uh, I'm not doing the stuff I say I want to do. And, and, and they're like, and like getting mad at me isn't working. And I keep saying I'm going to do it. And then I just don't. So at this point where they may have created like a compelling vision, they may have created like a really beautiful, like, I'm really clear why I want to do this. And yet they're still resistant to it. And when that's showing up, what we have to create is a structure that's sufficient to overcome their resistance. And most people, when they notice they're not doing something, they get into this sneaky intellectual conversation that sounds like this. Maybe the problem is, maybe the reason I'm not doing it is because I'm just not committed to it. Ah, oh, and if I'm not committed to it, maybe I just don't want to do it. Ah, okay, great. And then that allows them to not push into their resistance, not push into the confronting nature of whatever it is they're committed to, lets themselves off the hook. The power for these clients comes in the fact that they're, they're choosing from their commitment to keep engaging with the conversation. So from their commitment, I'm committed to this and I'm not doing it. What's next is the question that happens when we're committed. Not do I drop this? It's but I'm committed and there's a thing in the way of my commitment. I'm resistant and I'm not doing it. And so for those people, we create structure that supports them to overcome their resistance. There's many ways that can look. <clears throat> for some people, that structure is simply like verbally announcing to people they're going to do something at a time. And that's enough. You know, like if I tell my coach I'm going to do something by a certain point, I'm pretty reliable to do it because I know I'm going to be talking to her the next week. And I'm going to be telling her I did this thing or I didn't do this thing. For some people, that's not enough. Or for some things to which their resistance is high enough, that won't be enough. It's too, the gradient's too high. So they need a higher level of structure to overcome their resistance. It might be like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to get into conversation with people and I'm going to set up an accountability group. And we're going to get on the phone every day at this time and we're going to do this for an hour together. That can work. Sometimes you need something even higher. You need some hardcore consequences like old school commitment which people don't like. People are resistant to because it's going to force them to take the action they don't want to take. Those consequences might be like, if I don't do this thing that I'm declaring I'm going to do, I will donate X amount of dollars to the political party that I hate more than anything in the world. That's a really powerful, that one usually gets people taking action. And the funny thing is people are like, I don't want to do that because I can't stand that party. Okay. Are you committed to this action you say you're committed to? Well, yeah, obviously. Great. Are you going to do it? Yes. Great. So then why is this consequence an issue? What this does is it forces people's hand. People will get squirrely around this. As you create really powerful structures to support them moving into what they don't want to do, people start to get squirrely. I don't really want to do a consequence because I feel that's just going to be one more <clears throat> way to, to hate myself. I'm just going to be another stick to bash myself with. You're already bashing yourself with a stick. Adding in a structure to support you to overcome your resistance, you can do whatever you want with that, but you're already beating yourself up plenty by not doing the thing. Do you want to do the thing? Yes or no? Great. That's where we play. People prefer to aim themselves towards rewards for doing the thing because if you don't do the thing you're resistant to doing, the only consequence is you don't get the reward. That's no different than where you were yesterday. That's why consequences tend to be more powerful. Consequences motivate you by causing some pain when you don't do the thing you want to do. It can be very powerful. So we're always looking, what is, what is the place? Like, what is the structure that's going to support people to overcome their resistance? Now, Andrew asks a really good question, which is, when does forgiving ourselves for not doing the thing become a crutch for not taking action? So that's an important question, and that is part of what coaching provides help with. If I'm committed... If I say I'm committed to doing something, I'm committed to doing X, and for three weeks, I say, I'm going to do X, and then a week passes, and we check in, and I'm like, I didn't do X, 
At first, the breakthrough might be forgiving yourself for how you showed up. I hate myself. Fuck, I'm such a piece of crap. Okay, let's see if you can have a bit of compassion for yourself. Someone being able to like start to love themselves and open themselves back up, that's going to be a real gift, a real breakthrough at first. Until their life then, so that's a beautiful breakthrough. Way to go when you create that. Then yesterday's breakthrough becomes today's crutch. And what that means is this person creates the ability to forgive themselves for not doing things. And this is what Andrew's talking about. And now week after week, they show up and they're like, I didn't do that thing, but I didn't hate myself for it. I feel great. Okay, what do you want to do? Uh, I'll do it next week. And then they show up next week. I didn't do that thing, but I'm forgiving myself and I really feel that's important. Great. Next week. Yeah, I didn't do that thing, but I'm really feeling good about how much I'm forgiving myself. This is the point where we start to have to confront them with the next level of their truth. Are you actually committed to doing that thing? Because I notice what it seems like you're committed to doing is saying you're going to do it, not doing it, and then forgiving yourself. So is that your commitment or is your commitment that you're going to do the thing? Well, I want to do the thing. I just want to forgive myself too. Great. Well, it seems like first and foremost, we need to put your attention on doing the thing. So as coaches, we're always noticing what's the pattern that is now taking shape that is in the way of what this person says they want. There is not a moment where it's like after two times, forgiveness has become a crutch. It's sort of like a fluid dynamic. Uh, I see David's already answered this. David Medina said, it becomes uh, a crutch when you notice a pattern. That's exactly right, David. Just says, your comments regarding our beliefs, our stories, seek collusion, stick a stake in the ground, speak directly to a question that's been with me this week. Thank you. You're welcome, Jess. I'd love to hear the question if you're willing to share it. And David says, anything has the potential to become a self-deceptive mechanism by our ego. This is very true. Our ego will take whatever breakthrough we created and then use it to now keep you where you are today. So like one example of that would be, imagine you have someone who they really don't put any attention on their well-being. And that then becomes the reason they never take the action they say they're going to take. So like, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to call 10 people, and then they're d exhausted by the end of the day, they've got no food because they haven't eaten breakfast or lunch, and then they pick up the phone and they just pass out, right? So their well-being is sabotaging them. It's the thing in the way. They gotta, we got to address that. But then what will happen is they create the breakthrough around well-being. All right, fuck it. I get three square meals. I get eight hours of sleep. I drink water and I do not put stuff in front of that. Amazing. But now they're using that as the reason not to call those 10 people. Well, the time came, my alarm went off, but I hadn't eaten dinner yet. And I'm very committed to that. So I went and ate dinner and then I was starting to feel tired and I don't want to like not listen to my body. So I went to bed and that's fine too. But again, if week after week, we start to notice that the thing they say they want to do is never happening and they just keep going to their well-being, it's like, oh, the ego is now using well-being as the excuse to not do that thing. It's time to step into the next level. So there's always like, we're always stepping, creating the breakthrough, and then it's like, and where to from here? And where to from here? And where to from here? Andrew's saying he's been great at forgiving himself and is aware of the flexibility he gives to his commitments and have been practicing actually standing for those commitments, to make less commitments, but to actually commit to the ones he creates. Our commitment is what moves things forward. And it's also what we as humans are very resistant to leaning into because of the stories about what it'll mean we have to sacrifice. Oh, if I commit to that, I'll have to do this. If I commit to that, I won't be able to do that. And then that get that blocks us from creating the life we want because of what we're, we're not willing to do to have it. So it's worth asking ourselves, do I actually want this? <clears throat> I wanna talk about um, practicing versus finishing here. Most of what we take on in our lives is a function of, like we relate to it through the lens of finishing. So your to-do list, you know, all the stuff you have to do. And if you're like me, in order to not suck as a human being, it's a bunch of stuff you need to finish. I need to get it done. And that lens is a bit problematic for us because it, it makes us impatient with our own process. If I'm trying to forgive myself, for example, we hold that like it's something we should be able to do. 
And maybe if, if I start to work with a coach and then I start to like, my coach is like, Hey, I notice you really berate yourself. And I'm like, Oh yeah, I totally do. I suck. Okay. Stop. You're doing it now. Just knock that off. I notice you really berate yourself. So what about practicing noticing when you get upset and then forgiving yourself? Okay. I'm going to go do that. And <clears throat> what happens is we relate to that practice as something to be finished rather than something to be practiced. So when we're relating to it as something to be finished, something to be done, <clears throat> we kind of hold it like, I show up, I got angry. Oh, I'm getting angry. I forgive myself. The practice is complete. I'm done. I did it. And that does a couple of things. One, it provides us access to only a very superficial level of practice. This I often see in clients who have not, they're, they're fairly new to me. They kind of go away and try to put into practice the thing I've said. And they're like, yeah, I did it. And it totally worked. There's not much practice if something totally works, right? It'd be like, see if you can like practice passing the ball more in soccer. I did it and it totally worked. That's weird. I want you to practice it, work with it. And in order for us to practice something, we actually have to not succeed at it. If, if you do it perfectly every time, then there's not really much practicing. There's just you doing something you were already capable of doing. And then, then what were you practicing? Nothing. I'm right. Don't argue with me. So we have to engage with this stuff, with life, with what we're trying to take on from a lens of practice. The other thing that a context of finishing does is it leaves us feeling very disempowered and impatient. If I have this belief subtly, this unconscious belief that I should just go and do it, then every time I try to go and I can't do it, I get frustrated and I'm like, it's not working. It isn't working. So I'm like, oh, I want to practice forgiving myself. My coach said to go and look and notice where I'm not willing to. Okay, great. I'm going to go in and I'm, I'm going to finish it there too. And I go and I'm in a situation. I'm like, ah, this sucks. This person, I'm, ah, I hate myself. Ah, fuck. I should be able to forgive myself. Ah, I'm trying to practice. It's not working. We get very frustrated, very annoyed with ourselves. Ah, you jackass. You should be able to do this. Not at all. Not at all the case. There's no should to it. You're practicing something. So from a lens of finishing of, I should be able to do this. We don't have much space to grow from a lens of practice. There is no such thing as failure, right? There's no, if I'm practicing lifting weights at the gym, there's no like, oh, it didn't work. There's no like, oh, I, I couldn't, I lifted it six times, but not seven, so it didn't work. No, you're like, cool, I got to six. Let's see if I can get to seven next time. So that's the context that we always want to be working with as humans, leaders, and coaches as we engage with life as one of practicing rather than one of finishing, one of getting it done. This requires more space for ourselves, but it also engenders more spaciousness with ourselves. So that's, that's a little chicken and the egg. As you practice, you have to be willing to let go of the idea that you're going to get this perfect. That you're going you're gonna to have to let go of the comfort of like nailing it every time. Oh yeah, I did. It was easy. You have to let go of that. But the beauty in being willing to let go of doing it perfect every time, getting it, being a fast, you know, whatever the story is, the beauty of letting go of that is then you have more spaciousness for your own process. You don't have to get it right every time. You don't have to do it perfect every time. You can actually give yourself time and space to learn. And as you create more spaciousness for yourself doing that, you will find and discover that you have more spaciousness for your teams. And that's where leadership can really thrive. Is where you can start to hold the space, be the clearing for your teams to be in a process themselves. They're practicing something. They didn't fuck it up. They didn't fail. They just took their first swing. In practice, sometimes we need guidance. So you might need to provide a bit of guidance, help them see or even work with them. Like, okay, what worked? What didn't work? What is there to keep practicing? That's how leadership has grown. As long as we're holding for ourselves that we should be able to get it quickly or in one, or we should be able to finish it, or we should be able to do it perfectly, or it should just happen for us. As long as we have that, we can't hold any space for other people. People have a belief, a false belief that like, oh, I treat myself this way, but I have tons of space for other people. No, you don't. You're fooling yourself into believing that, but the medicine you give yourself is the same medicine you give others. So to whatever extent you're doing something internally, you are also doing it externally. And 
anything you're doing externally, you are also in some way giving yourself internally. It always goes both ways. The other distinction I'll talk about here that's similar-ish to this is generation versus stimulation. And this speaks a little bit more to Monica's question about like structures that support me. Um, <clears throat> hey, Lydia, nice to see you. Before I go there, I'll say, Lydia says, I find if I do practice as a game, it allows expansion of possibility. Totally. When we practice, it, it allows an expansion. It gives us so much more room. I can get on the bike and learn how to ride the bike because I'm practicing something as opposed to getting on the bike and I should be able to do this, right? Should is the death of practice because if you should be able to do something, there's no room to practice. You're already failing as soon as you try to step into practice. So practice is a, is a really potent context for us to bring to our life. Coming from that place, relating to ourselves and others from the place of practice really opens things up. It allows a tremendous amount of space. And most of us really want space. Most of the people that are desperate for more time, what you actually want is more space, an experience of spaciousness. So if you're one of those people who are like, how do I be hyperproductive? Shift to a context of practice. Okay. Generation versus stimulation. Um, stimulation is the thunderbolt. It's sitting down and writing when you're inspired. It's um, being bored and wanting something to change in order for you to not be bored. It's sitting down at the end of the day and not wanting to just sit doing nothing and turning on the TV. These are all ways of stimulating ourselves. Generation, so stimulation is fundamentally about changing your circumstances. This is the circumstances I'm currently experiencing. I require an injection of stimulation for my circumstances to be okay. I'm sitting here ready to write, but there's no inspiration. I wonder how I can make myself inspired, right? So I'm seek. I'm, I'm not taking the action I'm committed to given my current circumstances, which includes how I currently feel. I am, I am expectant and insistent upon a shift in those circumstances. My internal state needs to change before I can do the thing that I say I'm committed to doing. So that's stimulation. Generation is uh, an internal state that is created in the face of your circumstances. So one of these is kind of like outside in and the other is inside out. <clears throat> so when we act, this is all for you three peers. Three peers love that, that distinction, outside in versus inside out. The act of generating is entirely done internally. So if you are sitting in a conversation with someone and you are finding them boring, the opportunity is to come from a context of generation. What is there for me to generate here that would have this conversation be experienced as something other than boring? How could I relate to the way that they're speaking or showing up as fascinating rather than boring? And so much of this is about the internal story we're telling ourselves, right? Someone's like, uh, yeah, what I do is I fold socks for my life and I've been doing that for 20 years. And inside we're like, fuck you, you're so boring. How dare you even waste my time with this boring ass story? So our internal story is that what this person is telling me is boring. There's nothing of interest here and it's a waste of my time. How fast can I escape? We want to escape this moment and seek new stimulation that will leave us in an experience other than the boredom we're in. The opportunity of generation with the exact same circumstance would be to like, wow, there's a way I'm relating to what this person is sharing that has it occur to me as boring. How can I shift that? And that internal shift can be like, okay, what do I generate? Well, what about this is fascinating? Like I could ask myself that question and I could start to like, that's available if you're willing to engage at this level. 20 years folding socks? How do you stay in a position folding socks for 20 years? How do you find yourself into that job? I wouldn't even know where to begin. Who hires people folding socks full time as a career? How do you make ends meet? What do you do for fun? All of these questions are available from a context of generation. From a context of stimulation, none of that's available. What's available is this person's fucking shitty and I want to get away from them right? From stimulation, my life becomes about continually changing my circumstances so that I am stimulated. 
from generation, my life becomes about meeting life and the circumstances that show up exactly as they are and creating my own internal experience without regard to what's going on. So a life led from generation, from a context of generation, is one where you become the, the leader of how you experience life. You don't require life to be any different. From generating, things that happen in the world don't bother you so much, not because they're not bothersome, but because you are able to choose what they mean to you and how they show up. So for example, Elon Musk buying Twitter, there's a whole bunch of people that are all up in arms. Oh my God, he's doing horrible things, blah, 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 blah. Sure, that's a story about it. That's an entirely valid story. And yeah, people are gonna lose their jobs, but that's pretty much what happens anytime a company gets acquired. You know, anyone that invests $44 billion in a company that hasn't made profit seven out of the last nine years is probably gonna do a fair bit to change it up because in order to recoup that investment, there's work to be done. That's not that surprising, but it's the story about it that has us all up in arms. And so from a context of generation, we can actually create a story that works for us, a story that's empowering. We don't tend to like generation because it puts us back on the hook. People that want to have a writing practice often get caught in a context of stimulation. I sit down and I'm not inspired. I want to do more Facebook Lives. I really want to put myself out there, but I sit down and I don't know what to talk about. Well, generate something. Hit live. Start writing. Do the thing that you would be doing if you were inspired and basically set the table for inspiration to come. You don't have to do it this way. It's perfectly acceptable to wait for inspiration to strike. What I notice is the people that tend to be very prolific choose a context of generating their inspiration rather than one of seeking the stimulation of it. And those people do the thing that they want to do in service of generating the state that they want to be in rather than the other way around. Just checking to see if there's anything else I want to, oh, I guess that's the thing I'll say is like, going back to what Monica had asked and like the way I described my week, part of what I'm always doing is coming back into that context. Ugh, I'm having a week where I feel like there's just a never ending amount of stuff for me to do and I'm never I'm never getting it all done. And then I I give myself time for my humanity and you know express annoyance or anger or frustration. What if there's emotional if emotion to allow, I allow it. And then what do I want to generate? How do I want to show up to my day? So that context of generation can do amazing things for us, it can really set us free. Look at this rock. This is cool. This is selenite. It is what's called a TV rock. You can see stuff behind it because it's all uh, fiber optic. It's a fun little aside for you. Um, okay, I'm going to talk about the sliding floor of Facebook and social media and what that means for me and my content. And I'm going to talk about, um, but aren't you just letting people be jerks? that aspect of leadership. And I think that'll take us to the end today. We'll see. <clears throat> what have you written here, uh, Andrew, before I do that? Andrew says, I'm finding more and more for myself that I've got to use the structure of scheduling in generation. If I put on my calendar to write content, it often won't happen. As much as I resist it, it is becoming more apparent that committing to a time and date on my calendar is needed. It sounds like if I'm reading this correctly, Andrew, your Oh, I see. Put in my agenda, not my calendar. Right. You, Andrew's saying he actually needs the structure of blocking off time in his calendar rather than just having a loose to do on his agenda. Right. So that's an example of a, a little more structure that Andrew's describing. Right. The, the lower grading of structure would be, oh, just write on your to do list, spend time writing today. And he's noticing that's not sufficient to overcome his resistance. And it's worth noting here we have active and passive resistance. Active resistance is where I know that I'm meant to do something. Like I get a reminder right here on my computer that says, do this. And I go, fuck you. I just set it aside. I clear it. I ignore it. I'm actively resisting doing it. I'm choosing something else. That's active resistance. Passive resistance is, is sort of resistance that doesn't always look like resistance because it's not quite so deliberate. Passive resistance would be like, oh, I just ran out of time. So... I meant to do it, I would have done it, but my day was just so busy. 
And then the next day, I meant to do it, but my day was just so busy. That's passive resistance. It's resistance because if you were truly committed to this, your day being busy would not get in the way. For example, if you have children, you are probably very committed to feeding them their meals, regardless of how busy the day gets. There's no passive resistance in the way of that. But we have passive resistance to stuff that's a little uncomfortable. So regardless, I, I'm just making that sidebar so that people recognize like resistance doesn't always look the way it is. And it's helpful just to relate to it all as resistance. And Andrew's saying actually blocking the time off the day and time in his calendar actually is sufficient to overcome his resistance. So it's an example where he's creating a structure sufficient to overcome that resistance that he has. Jess is saying one of the great harms of capitalism and consumerism is the erosion of our generative capabilities and also cool rock. It is a cool rock. I don't, capitalisms and consumerism, yeah. I don't know if I would say, I don't know if I'm on the same page as it being so much a function of capitalism and consumerism. I can see like that line, how we got there, I think. But like for me, the way I have it is that it's not really, capitalism and consumerism, I guess, hasten the process, but it's, it's human for us to seek pleasure and resist discomfort, which is ultimately pain. You know, it's a level of pain. And so capitalism is just making it easier for us to do that. And it provides more incentives to do that to ourselves. This is, this is part of why like people are pushed towards, um, creating outrage. It's comfortable to be pissed off at like it's wrong that social media is not wholly responsible for doing that. That's us. It just makes it easier. It, it, it makes the conduit to doing that much easier and more rewarding because people follow you and share it. And so I guess I'm with you, Jess, in as much as like, it's part of like an upshot of them, but it's also not, I don't think we can put it firmly on capitalism and consumerism because those things are just humans creating efficient ways to do what we're already reliable to do. And often I see people like, if we went back to the gold standard, you know, or if we didn't allow marketing, we'd still do the same fucking stuff, people, because it's internally. And consequently, that's where the work lies for all of us is um, to like recognize, oh, consumerism is helping me do something that's actually already comfortable and it's making it easier, but the work is still going to be here no matter whether it's consumerism, capitalism, commercials, whatever. So, hey, Katie, nice to see you. And just saying a daily struggle as a mom. Hell yeah. But not feeding your kids. I'm willing to bet not feeding your kids, not a daily struggle. Hi, ye, says Katie. Um, and Andrew, right, uh, putting in my agenda. Okay, so here along those lines, oh, what have you written, Andrew? It could also be the availability of all the things we have in our modern day that creates that comfort and pleasure. Yeah, so human nature, just like an amoeba, an amoeba, there's two ways you can motivate an amoeba. You can put a little bit of sugar and it'll go towards the sugar, or you can poke it with a stick and it'll move away from the stick. And humans have layers upon layers upon layers of complexity built on top of that very simple system, but that is still fundamentally what's going on. That's what the reward center is. It's, it's like, that's the sugar, go towards the sugar. And then we have a pain nervous system that responds to pain, which is like, go away from that. And like those layers of complexity are abstracted away from the physical realm. They exist sort of spiritually, emotionally. It's painful for me not to fit in with the in group, the group in power. It's painful. So that's all there. And um, all of what we've built around us is like a reflection of that complexity. And it all just pokes us in the same place. And so the opportunity is human, is conscious human is to recognize that's what's happening and then to be in the very difficult, very challenging practice of choosing something outside of that. So instead of just seeking pleasure, choosing like, what am I actually committed to? And then actually walking that path. That's really tough. That is a practice. And anytime I see someone practice that at all, you know, even if the, the practice just looks like I can see that what I'm doing in this moment is I'm going after the comfort and safety of what is easy and pleasurable instead of walking towards what I say I'm committed to. That's practice. Just noticing yourself doing it is a form of practice because if you see it enough, eventually you're going to get sick of it. If your ego can wrap that up and wind it down to below your consciousness, then it's going to happen and you don't have anything to do about it. You'll just do it naturally. So the more we can bring consciousness to something, that is a form of practice. 
Okay, here's the deal with Facebook. I've been thinking about this for a while, which is Facebook, social media in general, right? Facebook, YouTube, uh, Twitter, TikTok, all of all of social media is geared towards like rewarding certain patterns of behavior that are kind of already rewarded internally. So what I mean is like those systems have been designed to like what gets the most views, right? What keeps you attached to the platform and what gets the most views is the same thing that gets the most attention in our basic physiology. It's just scaled up, which is like outrage, um, simple kind of platitudinal truths, right? Like always be nice, a little more complex than that, right? But like those simple, you know, sort of memes that are leadership soundy that, you know, um, so that sort of stuff, feel goodery, you know, uh, political stuff, that tends to be what is rewarded. You've probably noticed that's not what I'm about. That's not what I'm doing. The second thing is that those platforms want to encourage you to engage with them using their apps. And the reason they want to have you engage, engage with them via their apps is because that gives them more insight into you. The more you use Facebook's iPhone app, the more it notices like how much time you spend where, the more it can understand, oh, when we show Adam this, he does that. And when we show Adam that, he tunes out, therefore show him more of this. So they can, they can, by having you engage more directly with them through their app, they can engage more directly with you. And then it, it forms like this tight, uh, you know, nesting or whatever. You become tightly coupled. That's the word I'm looking for. So I don't do that. I make a point of not doing that on my phone. I don't have the Facebook app because I don't, I don't want to have them tightly coupled with me. I log in annoyingly through their mobile website, which sucks. It's super annoying. You got to like click in, you got to log in, you got to do this stuff. The interface isn't as nice as when it's an app because they're not, they're putting their attention on developing the app because that's more rewarding for them. The more they have someone engage them through the app, the more they can track, the more they can keep the person there. The, the more someone's engaging with them through their mobile app, they can't really do that. It's a browser. They don't have as much access. There's like a firewall between me, my psychology, and them. So I do that. There's a consequence to this. The consequence is that I don't have access to the same kind of features that would be available if I were to use the app. Like I can't use the nice backgrounds that Facebook offers. Or when I do a live, it's a little less easy for me to use because I can't just invite someone on. You can only do that through the app, et cetera, et cetera. So there's rewards for coupling yourself more with, with their app. And there's a ton of consequences. And for me, I don't feel that the rewards out benefit the consequence. The consequences are greater than the rewards. So let's just minimize this. So I'm very committed to this. The, the biggest consequence of that is that over time, the app naturally, not maliciously, but naturally is going to engage with me less. I'm going to fall further and further out of sync with what jives on Facebook. Facebook, what jives on Facebook, what jives on Twitter, what jives on YouTube is outrage, is this simple stuff, is platitudes and is people engaging very directly with the media so they can do more of the stuff and they can share more of the stuff and so on and so forth. So I'm naturally, as time goes on, falling out of sync with Facebook. In the early days, I was quite tightly coupled because they were asking less of me. I was asking less, of, you know, you get the idea. So there's an inevitable move like this. I'm present that what I could do is like couple myself with the app and then go in that direction, but I'm not going to do that because I don't want to. And so the upshot of this, and, and it's taken me a while to reach this, is over time, eventually, inevitably, I'm just going to fall away from Facebook. And that's already, I'm already starting to see that. Like, I still post with the same regularity. The algorithm just gets my stuff in front of less people because less and less people are interested in a long form post. People are interested in something punchy that they can share that's fuck you. That gets shared really quick. Or inspiring story. Ah, didn't have to think too much about it. Share. So it's okay, just that over time, this platform and probably most of the social media platforms and I will just slowly start to move away. 
So if you like this kind of content from me, what I invite you to do is engage with me, make sure you're connected to my mailing list, to my podcast, or I guess to my website would be the third one because that's where there is a direct connection. That's where there isn't a platform mitigating what does and does not work. And the truth is that these social media platforms are not doing it maliciously. They're doing it because they are simply a scaled up version of our own reward and punishment system. What I'm offering is something outside of that. And so over time, that's just gonna fall away in these systems. These systems are moving towards more of a simplified version of reward punishment. And as we are trying to have a conversation that transcends that, it's just going to get nudged out for better and for worse. For better, because these conversations aren't that interesting to a lot of people on Facebook anyhow, right? What, what is really interesting is the fiery stuff, the caliente stuff. So that's what I would advocate doing. And I would advocate doing that with anyone that you find really engaging where you are wanting like transformational kind of conversations. Facebook's probably not really going to be the place to, to have those as time goes on. It's already happening. It's just going to happen more and more. I don't think there's anything else for me to say on that. Other than I, I considered for a while, like, well, maybe I should get the app. Like, maybe I should thrust this conversation into that medium because given the way that that's going, it's more important than ever to do that, which is true. But this the floor is tilted, right? Like, what gets shared is not this conversation. This, this live show has had, like, 10, 4, sometimes 20 viewers for its entire duration, which has been, like, five years. If it was going to grow, it was going to grow. This is just not the conversation that, that catches fire on Facebook. And so that floor is tilted. And as time goes on, it's just naturally going to slide. Could make it my game to run uphill against that, but that's not the game I'm here for. Okay, that's enough of that. Enough doom and gloom. It's not really doom and gloom. It's all fine and good. It's just the way it is. And Jess, what do you say? Jess says, I say to my sons, are you bored? Are you being bored? Uh, are you bored or are you being bored? She said, they're actually very creative, but damn, there's a lot of advertising aimed at kiddos, promising constant stimulation. Yeah, and, and it's really valuable to recognize we as adults do the same thing. It doesn't always show up as like boredom, but we seek so much of the early stage of coaching. Like the first six months for a lot of clients is really learning how to be a client. And part of the way that is, is for them to notice their expectations of things needing to change so that they can feel the way they want to feel. Boredom is one of many ways that shows up. So sometimes it's like, um, I don't feel safe, right? Like the people in this meeting need to change the way they're showing up so that I can feel safe. That's a bit of a challenging one, which is part of why I'm bringing it into the space because it's also one of the ones, like as soon as you say that, people are like, ah, must do, they clamber. Right? It's very easy to get people to collude with us in that. But in a space like The Forge, which we do a great deal of work setting up a very powerful, safe container, and we do a lot of agreement setting, we do a lot of all of this stuff, and we check with people each step of the way, they still end up at a point where they don't feel safe and where that becomes their trump card. And that's another example where there's sort of like a real powerful opportunity for them to notice, oh, I'm seeking a stimulative solution here. I'm seeking things to change rather than a generative one. Let's create a different example that's a little less uh, fiery because safety, I really recognize, can be a challenging one for a lot of people. So it could be like um, uh, huh, people aren't being vulnerable enough in this conversation. They're just sticking to small talk instead of going inwards, right? So that's seeking that they should change instead of going inwards to ask yourselves a question like, hold on, how am I being right now that is having me relate to them as something other than vulnerable? What if this is vulnerability for them right now? And I'm just not willing to meet them in it. That can be a generative conversation too. Okay. Mm -mm -mm. And I think you're right, Jess, that um, there is so much advertisement that is geared towards stimulating. That That is the world we live in, is if you just buy this product, then you won't have to feel the way you do. That That's ultimately all of what um, consumerism really is. And um, you can see it in God, the gods must be crazy, which if you haven't watched, 
it's kind of a funny movie. It's a little, it's probably a little insulting by today's standards. I think it was made in 1980s, 83 maybe. And, uh, but it's very funny. It's still a very funny movie. And I don't, it's not totally accurate in how it portrays like the Kalahari Bushmen, but I don't, I don't think it's wholly insulting. Like I think you can watch it without being offended, but in that movie, the premise is there's this tribe of Kalahari Bushmen and they don't, they don't, their lives are very simple. You know, they know how to pull up roots from the ground to get moisture. They know how to hunt. They pray and thank the animal for its, its sacrifice to feed their families. You know, they're, they're a harmonious indigenous uh, group of people. And then one day an airplane goes over and it throws a bottle, a glass Coke bottle. The pilot just hucks a glass Coke bottle out the window. He litters. And the glass Coke bottle lands and one of the Bushmen find it. And suddenly this bottle becomes a problem. Everyone wants it and there's only one of them and they start taking turns and they get impatient with each other and it provides so much. They can use it for music. They can use it to make art. And it, and it like, it's kind of a beautiful metaphor for how like this belief we have of scarcity drives so much of what then happens. You know, if we really could trust in the abundance of the world, a lot of our consumerism starts to fall away. I don't have to rush out to buy that next thing because there's going to be another next thing right after it. Anyhow, Gods Must Be Crazy is kind of a cool movie. I like it still. Let's talk about our last topic. I'm going to switch this mic over to my right ear. It starts to get painful if I wear it too much on one side. Um, <clears throat> so one of the concerns people have when I start talking about like leadership is, but Adam, if you let people just do what they want to do, a bunch of people are going to be fucking assholes and they're going to step on people's necks. And so the way that they arrive there is ultimately a leadership conversation, a coaching conversation is about what do you want to the person? What do you want to create? And most people that aren't particularly deep in their own work are going to try to guide this person. Like if the person's like, I want to have a million dollars. I don't care what it takes. You're going to be like, well, what about they're going to try to push this person away from, you know, whatever it happens to be. Or maybe you have someone who's like, I'm married, but I want to have sex with young co-eds. Okay. Got it. So they're going to be like, but don't you care about, you know, they're going to nudge them because they don't trust this person. And so when we start talking about how leaders need the capacity to do and be whatever is required to create the result they want to create, people immediately get stuck and are like, but you're advocating and inviting people to be shitheads. Like what if someone decides they want to be king of the world and they want to step on everyone's neck to do that? So that's an understandable concern. And I want to talk about how that's not the way it actually goes through a deep transformational leadership conversation. So when someone, when someone brings that conversation, the immediate reaction everyone has typically is the one I just described, which is like, oh, but that's going to be bad. And then they try to fix them. And as soon as you try to get, as soon as someone's trying to fix you, you know, nudging you along a particular path, trying to get you to see something deeper, what happens is you, you grab a hold of the thing you have because you feel someone trying to pull it away from you. They're trying to take it away and you're like, ah. And then what you do in that conversation is you tolerate them. You listen, mm, uh-huh, that's a good point, right? If anyone's ever telling you that's a good point, you're probably not coaching or they're probably not listening to you as coach. So we're, we don't wanna do that. But that's what happens typically already. People don't trust you to like actually have a good heart underneath that. They relate to you as like, oh, this person needs me to help them come up with a good goal so that they can make the world a better place. No, that's your agenda. What we have to do is first totally allow them to be right where they are. And what we're, what we're holding fundamentally is internally we have this belief. We're operating from a place, a belief that every human being who is whole and complete, I'm not talking about people with like, you know, brain damage or chemical, like sociopathy, you know, stuff where there's like just wires that aren't connected. I'm talking about whole and complete humans, the vast majority of humans. We start from the belief and we act as the belief that people are good of heart. People have good hearts. People have light and people 
with all possibilities available would choose in alignment with that good heart. So from there, we start, hey, America, it's nice to see you. From there, we don't try to nudge someone away from that goal they started with. We instead say, okay, got it. You want to be king of the world. And we start to get curious and ask questions to explore that belief more, that desire rather more. Why is that important to you? Well, then I could do anything I wanted. Okay, what would you do? Well, I would, I would do this. I would travel. Okay, and, and what else? Well, I wouldn't work. I wouldn't have to work at all. Okay, so if you had all that free time, what would you do? Just eat like legs of mutton and M&Ms or what? Well, no, I'd probably like blah, 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 blah. That whole conversation only exists if we're willing to let them begin and stay in the conversation about being a king for as long as it takes. Because we try so quick to nudge them off, we can never get to the deeper desires that they have. So that's the first part. The second part is that people often have a goal that involves like mm, shoving other people aside, I'll call it. So there's this like, I want to make $2 million. And to do that, I recognize I'm going to have to work my employees really hard and then fire them at the end so that I can get the maximum profit and buyout for this company. So a lot of people hear that and be horrified. Or what they do is like, well, I got hired to, hire, to help this guy. So I'm going to shut my heart off, guy or girl. I'm going to shut my heart off and I'm going to like help them do it. And I'll just accept that this person's a pile of garbage, but I'm getting paid money. Kind of doing the same thing yourself. Instead, again, we want to meet with them where they are and we want to get curious. And if the label you've applied to this person is they're greedy and that's why they want to do this, there's not much to be curious about, right? It's really like, why is that the way you want to burn people instead of this way? But if we're holding, if we're acting and living and relating to them through the belief that people have good hearts, well, then that's something to start get curious about. Huh, interesting. Why is it that you want to, make those $2 million, like, why do you want to do it that way? Well, that's the only option I have is like, basically, if I want to exit with this amount of money, I have to do it that way. Okay, huh? And why is it you have to do that? And as we ask these questions, what we're going to start to discover, excuse me, is the stories and the beliefs and the evidence about how their world and their life and their business has to go. They've got stories, beliefs, evidence, etc. that says, if you want X, you have to do Y. The magic of transformational work is that we bust up those stories. The size, the foundations upon which people's actions rest, we've, we shake up those foundations such that new actions are available to them, new choices that previously weren't. So we start to ask questions like, okay, tell me more. Like, why does it have to be that way? Well, because of this, blah, 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 blah. And you're going to start to find like the way this person's world is set up is that in order to have X, you have to be willing to do Y. You can have Y, which is everyone feels loving, but then you have to sacrifice X. And currently at this point in my life, I'm not willing to sacrifice X. And from there, we can start to say, well, what if we took a look at that story? Like if it was possible to have X and Y, would you want that? Like if it was possible to exit your company with the $2 million, but everyone got to keep their jobs, would you want that? Like, I'm not saying it is, but I'm just curious if that was available, would you want that? Oh, absolutely. And what we start to discover is people make choices, not because of the shitty labels we apply to them, not because of the surface level. You know, it's like we have a, you know, a, a, a name tag that's got like a shitty, like greedy, slutty, lazy, flaky, arrogant, and then we're just like stick slap on their forehead. That's why that's how this person is. And that's why they're behaving the way they are. And I got no time for greedy people. Wow, that person got pigeonholed and dismissed so fast. There's no opportunity for leadership there. And once someone gets labeled that way, we're going to keep relating to them through that lens. And it actually encourages them to keep showing up that way because they're like fuck it it doesn't matter that i try to do good people keep relating to me as greedy anyhow fuck it i'm just gonna do that if i'm already being treated as guilty of a crime why not commit the crime so we can't even see that these labels we throw at people actually reinforce the behavior that we are condemning them for instead when we really look through the lens of possibility and start to open things up 
what happens is people see new opportunities and that starts to have them willing to like question these stories upon which all their actions rest. And as you do that, this is a leadership conversation. That's what the leadership conversation is, is helping people notice first the stories, the foundations upon which all their actions and choices rest. And seeing like, is that the, do you want an option that is not allowed by this foundation? And if they're like, well, yeah, I'd love that. Great, then let's break up that foundation. And if you do that, people start to discover, oh, it's actually possible for me to both be profitable and make money and do good in the world and leave people better off than when I first found them. And if they can start to discover that that's available, I promise you that is what they will start to do. Maybe not always, maybe not immediately, maybe it's an ongoing practice, but every single human who is whole and complete has a desire to come back to the light. All of our behaviors that we label as shitty are done out of a mistaken, and even though it's mistaken, it's kind of proven, it's born out in the world, we have evidence for it, but a mistaken belief that I have to do this in order to achieve that. And so this is the miracle of leadership, of transformational leadership. When we break those stories up, people start to discover like, oh, that's not true. And that allows them to live into the possibility of being able to have it all. Wow, I could have all of the freedom I crave and I could feel incredibly generous. Well, I'm gonna start doing that. And so over time, when you work with people in this way, you don't have to do stuff like punish people as much. You don't have to do stuff like create really, um, really like rigid, nasty, nasty is not the right word, but like rigid laws and rules and regulations to like bash people with to force their action. Because what happens is that action becomes sourced from within. It's what we desire as human beings. So that's the, that's the challenge of leadership. It's not that we're, we're not just letting people be jerks, although we have to be willing to start there because all of us have a degree of selfishness. All of us act in, when we're afraid, we all act selfish, greedy, et cetera, et cetera. We all have that capacity. So we have to be willing to meet and engage with people at that place without needing them to change at all in order to bring them, to support them, to come back down to a deeper level, to create new possibility, to then start to have things go differently. So this is the possibility I stand for in this work and leadership. And it's not the default. And I don't know that over, like this, the possibility I stand for is over time, we all are able to engage with each other at this level. And that, that you know, we don't, we don't have to do things like cancel people and, and do stuff like that. But the floor is tilted. <laughs> the floor is tilted towards outrage, condemning people, othering people, and then pointing the finger at them and saying they're garbage because, and then them saying the same thing to us and back and forth. So that's the possibility. That's what's available. If that sounds cool to you, well, I hope you engage with it the same way I'm committed to engaging with it. So no, we're not creating a clearing to allow people to just walk on the necks of everyone, but in order to have them let go of that as the only path they can see, we have to let them be there. That's the hard part. We have to trust in our hearts that there is light and goodness in every single human being. And we have to meet where they're showing up as in the moment, meet where they're showing up from in the moment at that place with that trust and then seek it. We have to seek the light. Okay, well, that's all we got today. I'm gonna keep doing these lives, by the way, until until there's zero viewers, until it gets to the point where there's just no one coming and watching, and then I'll do them on my website, and that's how it'll go. Hope you guys are having an awesome Friday. I hope you're ready for that hardcore beer binge before the weekend, and I hope you guys have an amazing weekend. That's everything we got for you today. Peace.